Great, thank, thank you, Steve. Um, so briefly, uh, Dr. Shapiro uh, has been a Wisconsin lifer. We, we uh, he left for a little bit, but uh, Dan did his medical school training here at UW, followed by his residency, and left for uh, what was uh, felt like a few quick years, maybe uh, Dan for you uh, felt like a long couple of years at MD Anderson in uh, in Houston, uh, in a fellowship in general urinary oncology, and has returned on staff as an assistant professor in the CHS track uh, here at UW. So. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Abel wasn't able to to uh, give his presentation this morning, so Dan is uh, pinch hitting on short notice. So thank you, Dan, in advance for your time and your expertise. The floor is yours. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Dr. Williams. Yeah, so um, I'll be talking about uh, small renal masses today. Um, so I don't have any um, disclosures. So just to start with some background, um, so the, the incidence of kidney cancer is relatively high. It's a major cause of cancer in both males and females and within the top 10 cancer diagnoses for both. In males, it's number seven and in females, it's number 10. So kidney cancer uh, accounts for a large portion of uh, cancer diagnoses in individuals uh, in the United States. So it's an important disease to understand and understand how to treat. We also know that the incidence is particularly higher in Western countries uh, compared to the rest of the world. And, and what's interesting is that the incidence of kidney cancer has been steadily rising over the last decade. So if you look, uh, this is a study looking in the UK, over the last decade, the incidence of kidney cancer has increased by about 40%. And so, what that probably comes down to is not that patients are being exposed to more carcinogens or the population, you know, genetic risk is increasing. What's happening is uh, we're just imaging people more often. It used to be that kidney cancer was kind of the internist diagnosis. A patient would present with, you know, gross hematuria, flank pain, systemic symptoms. The internist would palpate the flank and find a 20 centimeter renal mass, and that's how the patient would be diagnosed. Well, now today, a patient goes to the emergency room uh, with some vague abdominal pain, they get a CT scan or an MRI, and we find a two or three centimeter renal mass. And so really this is changing from being an internist diagnosis to a radiologic diagnosis. And this is probably what's accounting for the increase in incidence of kidney cancer. So, and this is reflected in some of the SEER cancer statistics. So if you look at the incidence of kidney cancer over the last um, you know, 20 years or so, we see that it's been steadily rising, like I was talking about, but the mortality really hasn't increased at all. So it seems that we're diagnosing these renal masses earlier and it isn't uh, increasing the mortality. And you also see a uh, relatively high uh, percent of patients surviving at five years around 75 percent. So it seems that overall we're diagnosing these tumors earlier in their um, disease progression. So I said that about 75 percent of patients uh, are alive at five years. What accounts for the 25 percent of mortality at five years? So if we look at these patients, for patients who have localized disease, that's a very low percent of patients who are dying from kidney cancer at five years, only about 7%. If a patient has no visceral metastatic disease or bone metastases, but has lymph node involvement, the rate increases. About 30% of those patients uh, will die uh, at five years. And then in patients who are first identified uh, with metastatic disease, about 88% of those patients um, will be dead at five years. So the majority of patients, the majority of the mortality that's accounted for kidney cancer at five years comes from these patients who are being diagnosed uh, with metastatic disease. So how does this increase in cross-sectional imaging impact our treatment of kidney cancer? So this was a study um, from JAMA uh, that looked at um, 15 million Medicare beneficiaries aged 65 to 85 over about a four-year range from 2010 to 2014. And they looked at 306 different hospital referral regions and looked at how the increase in CT usage uh, changed the treatment of renal masses. And 
look to see whether or not it increased the, the rate at which renal masses were being treated. And they risk adjusted their analysis for age, sex, race, and, and smoking status. And so what the, they found is that obviously, as you would imagine, more imaging equated to more treatment. So um, for every 182 additional CT scans, they found that an additional renal procedure was performed. So either partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, or an ablation, basically any renal procedure increased with the increasing use of CT scans. And you can see Madison's represented here um, within that study as well. So we're kind of uh, middle of the range uh, in terms of the hospitals that were, or the regions that were evaluated. So what happens with these small renal masses that we're diagnosing? So this was a study uh, from 2010 out of Fox Chase. They did a SEER analysis looking at the localized surgically treated renal cell carcinomas uh, in about uh, or over 30,000 patients. And they stratified the outcomes of patients who were surgically treated by uh, kidney mass size. And they found that for the RCC masses that were less than four centimeters, mortali the mortality at 10 years was only 5%. So a very low risk of death at five years or at 10 years uh, with these small renal masses. And obviously as you increase the size of the renal mass, the, um, the rate of death increases as well. And so, given that, that we found that these small renal masses are unlikely to kill you, uh, people wanted to study whether or not it's safe to observe these renal masses. So this is the DISARM registry out of Hopkins, and they studied, they did a randomized trial looking at uh, intervention versus surveillance. And so they randomized 497 patients over from 2009 to 2014, and then they looked at the five-year cancer-specific survival. And they found that in patients who underwent an intervention, most of these patients received a, a partial nephrectomy, the five-year cancer-specific survival was 99%. And for the patients who at least underwent an initial period of surveillance, the um, survival at five years was essentially equivalent, about 100%. So this study really showed that surveillance of these small renal masses is, is safe in the appropriately selected patients. So what can we gain from looking at other cancers and how they're managed? If you look at the small renal mass um, outcomes, you can compare that to what we see in low-risk prostate cancer. If you look at the survival curves here of cancer-specific survival, uh, comparing small renal masses, which is this top blue line, to what we saw in Klotz's study, uh, looking at outcomes of active surveillance, you can see the curves are essentially equivalent. So we can use what we've gained from prostate cancer and active surveillance to kind of inform how we manage uh, small renal masses. And it seems that active surveillance of these small renal masses is a, a, a safe um, endeavor. And also, you know, kidney cancer, behaves, small renal masses at least, behave similar to prostate cancer in terms of uh, the age at which they're diagnosed. You can see the average age at which uh, kidney cancer is diagnosed is uh, 64, and the median age for prostate cancer is 66. So very uh, similar um, age distribution between the two cancers. So like low-risk prostate cancer, the decision for small renal mass treatment uh, can be made on individual basis, and you have to consider not only the cancer diagnosis, but other patient-specific risk factors, because those are very important if you have a, a tumor that is unlikely to kill you in the next 10 years, and your age at diagnosis is 64 years old. So it seems with small renal masses that the variations in survival are more dependent on the patient-specific factors than the actual cancer risk. So this is also from the Kudikoff study, and obviously you can see in these patients who are diagnosed with small renal masses, really the age of diagnosis significantly predicted your overall survival. And if you look at the probability of death over time, uh, the yellow um, lines here 
indicate non-cancer death and the blue line indicates kidney cancer death. And you see that non-cancer related deaths are much more likely over time than the kidney cancer specific deaths. So that's why when you're making these decisions about small renal masses, you really have to weigh in the other patient risk factors, uh, particularly the patient comorbidities. So making decisions with small renal masses. We need to use the data that we have to drive our patient specific decisions. So if you're presented with this renal mass in clinic, the first thing you wanna understand is, is this a cancer or not? Obviously that will dramatically change uh, how you counsel the patient and what treatment you decide to pursue. Also, if it is cancer, what's the worst case scenario in that situation? And should we be allowing that worst case scenario to drive our decision? And then what are the options or tests that I can use to find out more about this mass and what treatment that I should pursue with my patient? So just as, a, as, a, as an example, so this is a 50 year old healthy male with a CT for diverticulitis. And uh, the patient has the CT and then he's sent to the urology clinic and he has a nine millimeter enhancing, so 50 Hounsfield units renal mass. So in this less than one centimeter renal tumor, what's the chance that this is actually cancer? So in this situation, it's about a 50% chance for this mass. So if you took them to the OR, you have a 50-50 chance of putting them through a partial nephrectomy for no reason. And what is this number based off of? So this is a study uh, from Frank et al. Uh, from 2003, so a little bit older, but uh, a good study nonetheless. They looked at surgically treated renal masses. So these were masses that they were looking at final pathology. And they looked at about 2,700 patients and they stratified based on size and they looked at the rate of RCC versus benign disease after the tumor was removed. And so you can see in a tumor that was less than one centimeter, it's about a 50% chance that uh, it has cancer in it um, and about a 50% chance that it's benign. If you go above one centimeter, the rate of RCC increases fairly substantially. So once you get above a centimeter, it increases uh, almost to 78%. And then when you get to six or seven centimeters, it's close to 100%. So it seems that as the tumors get bigger, your chance of having a renal cell carcinoma increase as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this study is this is a surgical series. So is there a chance that we're overestimating the percent of RCC? So these patients are selected for surgery. So they probably at baseline have a higher cancer risk. Also, we know on final pathology, that's, that's a little different than when we evaluate them uh, on CT imaging or MRI. So we know that pathologic sizes tend to be smaller than the radiologic size, or at least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> um, but we know from biopsy series, um, so these are patients that had biopsies and the tumor wasn't removed. Malignancy was, uh, the rate of malignancy was similar to what we see in the Frank study. So in, in tumors that were less than four centimeters, the malignancy rate was about 74% of having true uh, renal cell carcinoma versus benign disease. So putting that all together, does having a small renal mass equate to having renal cell carcinoma? For a four centimeter enhancing renal mass, uh, it's about a 70 to 80% risk that it is renal cell carcinoma. And keep in mind, this is an enhancing renal mass. For a less than four centimeter tumor, the chance is obviously less. We saw from the Frank study, it's about 50% for a tumor that's less than a centimeter. If you have a tumor that's larger than four centimeters, then it's about 100% chance, or it's a, the chance is more. If you get to seven centimeters or so, the chance increases almost to 100%. So that's typically the numbers that I kind of counsel patients with, and uh, it's, they seem to be well validated looking at the literature. So moving on, so if we decide that this is renal cell carcinoma, what's the worst case scenario in this situation for this small renal cell carcinoma? So obviously we worry about the patient developing metastatic disease. Metastatic renal cell carcinoma is still a very devastating disease. The median survival around two is about two years, even with our best 
therapies. Now, this is probably getting better now that we have more advanced immunotherapy based regimens, but still we haven't seen a dramatic increase in the overall survival yet. Obviously, we've just started treating patients with immunotherapies over the last five years, so we may see some increase in the median overall survival, but um, right now it's still a pretty devastating disease. So, knowing that metastatic RCC is a, is a bad disease, what's our chance of developing metastatic disease from a small renal mass? And if the chance is very low, should we be using this worst case scenario to drive our management? So we have a 60 year old healthy male with a 2.5 centimeter renal mass. What's the chance that uh, you die from renal cell carcinoma within 10 years? So based on the literature, that chance is about 5%. And we saw that in the Kudikov study. So overall, pretty unlikely uh, for most patients that if they have a small renal mass, they'll die within 10 years. And so this is based on the Kudikov study that I mentioned. So looking at the SEER analysis of over 30,000 patients, uh, what's the 10 year risk of dying from renal cell carcinoma that's less than four centimeters? Well, the renal cell carcinoma mortality risk is about 5%. They also found that the mortality from other cancers is actually a little bit higher. It's about 7%. So you may be more likely to die from a different cancer. And then much more, uh, much, much higher rate of dying from a non-cancer related cause. So really these patients, the, the mortality doesn't seem to be driven by their RCC risk. It's more driven by their other patient specific factors, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So if we think of the worst case scenario, there's about a 5% risk of death from RCC in 10 years. So, what can I do to find out more about the mass? What can I do to help me counsel the patient? Well, first of all, everything we've been talking about is assuming that you have a high quality dedicated renal mass, uh, either CT or MRI, and that's really essential. That's kind of the first stratification point. If you have a mass that's not enhancing, the risk of it being RCC is uh, substantially lower. So really the first step is having a high quality imaging study to truly evaluate the, the renal tumor. The next uh, option is uh, performing a biopsy. Uh, you know, most, most tumors that I know of, we usually get a biopsy first. Renal cell carcinoma is kind of a little bit unique in the fact that often we're treating these patients without having a, a biopsy proven diagnosis. We have seen, however, that um, over time, there has been an increase in using biopsy for small renal masses. And the optimal role of that biopsy is, is still being defined. We've seen that about one in four small renal masses uh, undergo a, a biopsy in the current era. So is biopsy being overutilized in these patients? Is it being underutilized? What are the ideal patients to be, to be biopsied? So we have to think about the potential advantages of biopsy for small renal masses. First of all, we wanna make sure that we can identify cancer versus not cancer in our biopsy. That's probably our main goal. And then also sub the other goals would be to help us gain information that can guide our treatment decision-making. So those, the information that we could gather would be tumor grade, what type of RCC subtype, because we know that different RCC subtypes have different um, uh, risks of mortality. And also it'd be nice on the biopsy if we can identify aggressive features such as sarcomatoid elements. If you have a small renal mass that has sarcomatoid features, that's probably not a mass that you would want to put someone on active surveillance for. The other thing we wanna consider is, is biopsy safe. Uh, the complication rate obviously for a biopsy is going to be substantially lower than any procedure we're going to do to treat renal cell carcinoma. So if you think of it in that in that manner, you know, biopsy is pretty safe. One thing that patients often ask about is, you know, is there any chance of tumor seeding the biopsy tract? And that's very rare. Only about 1 in 10,000 have been reported with our modern biopsy techniques. And it's really no different than any other malignancy. You know, tumor seeding's even been reported in prostate cancer, and 
know, we very rarely worry about tumor seeding uh, in prostate cancer, and uh, it's similar for renal cell carcinoma. <clears throat> Uh, our group here, led by Dr. Abel, uh, looked at our complication rates and, and non-diagnostic rates in our biopsy series of over 1,000 patients, and uh, we found that the major complication rate was very low. Only 0.4% developed a clavian grade 3 or higher complication after undergoing a biopsy. And we stratified also um, by risk factors such as taking aspirin, having an elevated INR, or having thrombocytopenia. We really didn't see any increase for uh, any of these patients in terms of having a complication after biopsy. We did find that the non-diagnostic rate was about 15%, so it's low but not uh, insubstantial or unsubstantial. And uh, we did not find in a single patient any evidence of tumor tract seeding. <clears throat> we also looked across the different radiologists who performed the biopsies. So, we had 12 different radiologists performing biopsies over this patient cohort, and we really didn't see any substantial differences in terms of the rates of complications. Uh, we also didn't see any real significant differences in terms of the non-diagnostic rate. So it seemed that these biopsies were being able to be performed in a relatively reproducible manner, manner no matter who was performing the biopsy. So, talking about non-diagnostic biopsies, it seems that the rate of non-diagnosis uh, after a biopsy tends to range around the 15 to 20 percent uh, range, uh, and this has been demonstrated in multiple different series. Uh, the rate of non-diagnostic biopsy is dependent on the patient population, and also, you know, different studies define non-diagnostic non uh, in different ways. So. Non-diagnostic may be caused from insufficient tissue. The tumor may be targeted in an area of necrosis, so there was no viable tumor that was sampled, or areas of fibrosis, or the, the biopsy may have missed the tumor completely, and we only see benign kidney tissue on the biopsy specimen. So looking at the rate of non-diagnostic biopsy is, is variable depending on the study that you look at and also how it's defined. So, can we rely on our biopsy findings? Are they accurate? Um, and we, we need to stratify how we're defining that as, you know, whether is, are we talking about if the biopsy can determine if there's cancer or no cancer? Is it accurate in determining the RCC subtype or tumor grade? Also, how does biopsy help us in terms of identifying T stage? We know that a lot of times clinical, clinical T1A tumors may be upgraded at the time of final pathologic diagnosis because a small renal mass may have evidence of invasion into the perinephric fat. So that would change a clinically T1A tumor to a, a pathologic T3A tumor. And those patients have very different survival probabilities. So we know that biopsy accurately predicts the presence of cancer versus benign tumor. So RCC presence on renal mass bio biopsy pathology has been highly concordant with final surgical pathology in larger series. We see about 100% concordance in the study by Shannon et al. Um, and a similar rate uh, in a, a later study by Leverage et al. So we know that um, biopsy of renal cell carcinomas can accurately predict uh, the presence of cancer versus benign tumor. And then what about RCC subtyping? This also seems to be pretty accurately demonstrated on our biopsy findings. You can see in multiple studies here within the red box, the accuracy for RCC subtyping is uh, typically over 90%, uh, so quite high. At the lowest rate, it was about 86%. So overall, it seems that we can determine if it's cancer and we can also even determine what subtype of renal cell carcinoma it is. Now, what about grade? So, grade is a little different in terms of how well our biopsies can predict it. So, grade is important to understand because it's predictive of renal cell carcinoma specific survival, but on the biopsy specimen, uh, there can be sampling error. So, we know from studies previously, like this study by Ger Gerlinger et al. from the New England Journal of Medicine, they took renal cell carcinoma tumors and biopsied them in multiple places and did 
genomic stratifications and found that the tumors were very heterogeneous. Depending on where the biopsy was performed, you can get a very different uh, clonal population of cells or subclonal population that have different uh, genetic background. And this is also reflected in the grade. Depending on where the tumor is biopsied, the grade may be different. So there is grade heterogeneity throughout the renal tumors. So when we're doing biopsies of only small portions of the tumor, uh, obviously we're getting sampling error. And so the overall grade of the tumor may not be accurately reflected in the biopsy specimen. And this is demonstrated in multiple different series. You can see that the rate of accurate diagnosis between low or high grade is relatively low. At best, it's maybe in the 80% range, uh, but usually it ranges between 60 to 70%. So I tend to not rely too much on what the grade is read uh, at the time of biopsy. And getting back to the rate of upstaging in renal cell carcinoma is less than four centimeters. So about five to 10% of these clinically T1A tumors will be upstaged to PT3A because of the um, perinephric fat invasion. And so we know that the metastatic recurrence rate in these patients uh, is much higher in patients that uh, have fat invasion. Uh, so, and obviously on our biopsies, this is not often accurately uh, diagnosed. So there is some patients who will, or there are some patients who will undergo surgery and have pathologic upstaging. So overall, the accuracy of biopsy, it can accurately determine the presence of cancer. It can accurately uh, identify the histologic subtype but it doesn't uh, do a great job at accurately identifying the grade. So how can biopsy change our treatment? Well, biopsy improves our informed consent. Uh, patients may change their treatment decisions if they know that they have cancer. Also, patients with higher grade or if they have sarcomatoid features may elect a different treatment versus surveillance. Uh, also, you know, if we identify patients who have benign tumors, we're decreasing the rate that these patients are being treated and overall improving our outcomes in the management of small renal masses. This improves, you know, complications from surgery, reduces the cost to the healthcare system by avoiding treatment in a lot of these patients. So uh, that can have uh, significant effects uh, glo uh, globally in healthcare. Uh, we looked at uh, our uh, series of patients here, and we actually surveyed them uh, to determine their thoughts uh, about biopsy and their diagnosis of renal mass. And we gave 100 consecutive patients with small renal masses, less than four centimeters, a survey before and after their initial counseling after they were diagnosed uh, with a small renal mass. And so looking at these patients, they graded uh, things on an analog scale, and we asked them, how anxious or nervous were you about your renal mass diagnosis? And 46% of patients ranked the renal mass diagnosis as among the most stressful moments in their life. So this is a, a substantial uh, problem for our patients. And, you know, we kind of get to the point where we're like, oh, another small renal mass, um, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But for the patients, this can be really impactful and um, and terrifying moment in their life. And 84% of those patients answered yes when they were asked if knowing whether or not there's cancer in their mass would help them make a decision. So, you know, 84% of patients would be interested in the outcomes of the biopsy findings. And then also 84% of patients stated that they would consider having a renal mass biopsy. So it does seem to be that patients want uh, to undergo a renal mass biopsy um, before their initial counseling. And then we, uh, after our counseling, about 42% of those patients actually went on to receive a biopsy. So overall, it seems that this is something that patients are interested in and something that they would consider doing. So what are the arguments against biopsy? Well, the most common argument is that it's not gonna change my management. And I think that's accurate in some patients. So. In very young patients, biopsy is probably not going to change your management. Um, these patients probably are best served with just having extirpation of their renal mass. Also, if someone's extremely comorbid and they have a small renal mass, you're likely, even if it was renal cell carcinoma, to still survey these patients. Uh, you know, based on the previous studies, I said that the 
risk of mortality is very low compared to patient specific comorbidities. And so if you have an extremely comorbid patient, you're unlikely to intervene on these patients even with a renal cell carcinoma diagnosis. Unfortunately, in kidney cancer, this is a rare percent of the population that's diagnosed with a renal tumor. Most of our patients fall in, in kind of the 50 to 70 year old range. And so a lot of these patients, um, you can't really use this young or extremely comorbid to um, determine whether or not you should treat the renal mass. And a lot of times, you know, we're talking a lot about trifecta outcomes and, and performing partial nephrectomies and getting the best outcomes for these small renal masses. You know, the trifecta outcome is negative margin, no change in their kidney function and no complications. And so this study, they looked at their, their cohorts over di four different eras, uh, looking at their trifecta outcomes. And you see that uh, the patients that had malignant pathology, there was about 25% of patients that didn't actually have a renal cell carcinoma when they performed the partial nephrectomy. The, if you look over the four eras, the rate of benign pathology was 17 to 24%. So imagine if we knew it was benign, you wouldn't intervene or do a partial nephrectomy necessarily. So your trifecta outcome in those patients would be 100% if you didn't undergo a partial nephrectomy. So that's just something to consider with these small renal masses. So how can biopsy change treatment? There's been continued over treatment, like you see in that study of about 20 to 25% of small renal masses, which is really not reasonable if there's only a 5% 10 year mortality. And that, you know, over treating a small renal mass has effects on renal function and cost, et cetera. So overall, making patient specific decisions. So if you have a four centimeter solid renal mass, there's about a 70 to 80% chance that this is renal cell carcinoma. Getting back to, you know, what's the worst case scenario? Metastatic renal cell carcinoma is probably the worst case scenario, but this is pretty unlikely with only a 5% risk of mortality at 10 years. And then what are the other tests that we can use to find out more? Well, high quality imaging is, is a must and, and and also biopsy when it may improve our patient specific decision making. Now, a little word on oncocytic neoplasm. So, oncocytic neoplasm is something that you may encounter when you get a, a renal mass biopsy. And there was some concern historically about the risk of having concurrent or metachronous RCC uh, with these oncocytic neoplasms which may push people towards wanting to treat them regardless of having a biopsy that says it's an oncocytic neoplasm. But it seems that in our modern data, the risk of having this hybrid tumor is pretty low. There's a study by Ginsburg et al. from 2014. They found about a 2.7% chance of having a hybrid tumor. So having a tumor that had oncocytic neoplasm and then also having a concurrent RCC and all of these patients had chromophobe RCC and none of the patients progressed. So even in patients who did have a hybrid tumor, uh, they were pretty low risk tumors and none of them progressed. Uh, we also looked at uh, our series here of patients who had either biopsy proven or final pathologic diagnosis showing oncocytic neoplasm. Um, we retrospectively reviewed 171 patients and looked at how they were managed. We treated 14 with ablation. We initially surveyed 90 of them and then 67 patients underwent surgery. Uh, and they had a median follow up of 40.1 months. And we found that really observation should be considered for most of these patients who have less than four centimeter oncocytic tumor. None of the patients um, uh, who were placed on active surveillance had progression to metastatic disease and no patients who had a tumor that was less than four centimeters had any progression to metastatic disease. So overall, it seems for a small renal mass that's biopsy proven oncocytic neoplasm, observation could be considered for most of these patients, at least uh, for an initial period of surveillance. So we've talked a lot about surveillance and, and diagnosis. What about treatment of small renal masses? What's the best treatment for these? And how do we decide? So 
we want to look at what are the best cancer outcomes, what preserves renal function, uh, what's the least uh, morbidity from each procedure. And then the other thing, obviously, we want to consider is does the patient need treatment? And we've kind of talked about some of that already. So the typical treatment for localized renal cell carcinoma, surgery is the standard approach, nephron sparing, uh, is definitely the gold standard, uh, especially if you can do a minimally invasive approach. Other options include thermal ablation, and then obviously we've talked about active surveillance as well. So this is the 2016 AHRQ management of small renal masses. It's a huge document. Uh, they did a meta-analysis of the diagnoses and treatment approaches for small renal masses. Um, they did note, obviously, that there is no randomized clinical trial between surgery and ablation. They did note in the meta-analysis that radical nephrectomy was associated with uh, worse functional outcomes compared to partial nephrectomy or ablation. Um, and so that's really why partial nephrectomy um, and ablation have become uh, more of the standard approaches for small renal mass treatment. Uh, this study from Mayo looked at uh, oncologic outcomes comparing partial nephrectomy to uh, thermal ablation. Uh, they had 17, almost 1,800 patients with clinical T1 renal masses, and the majority of those patients underwent partial nephrectomy. They found that the five-year cancer-specific survival was essentially equivalent regardless of the treatment modality and was very high for all treatments. Now, one problem with this study is the rate of having benign disease or not even having a, a biopsy diagnosis uh, was pretty high. You can see in the partial nephrectomy, about 20% of the patients had benign pathology at final diagnosis. So that may skew some of the cancer-specific outcomes if you have a cohort that has a large percent of patients who have benign pathology. And so again, this, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve from that study showing very high rates of cancer-specific survival. Now, for, for these reasons, we perform biopsy prior to ablation, and we've looked at this um, frequently, and, and some uh, centers will perform the biopsy at the time of the ablation, and we really prefer to perform the biopsy before the ablation so that if it is a benign uh, tumor, we wouldn't proceed with the ablation. And so we really advocate for performing the biopsy prior to the patient being in the radiology suite about to get their ablation. And we know that local recurrence is more common for thermal ablation, uh, and, but we don't see significant changes in cancer-specific outcomes. So patients who undergo ablation may be at a slightly higher risk of local recurrence. So just to summarize some of the thermal ablation studies, uh, a lot of these studies are difficult to interpret because they really look at just small renal mass, but they may not necessarily have biopsy-proven RCC. So this may overestimate some of the cancer-specific outcomes. Uh, ablation is preferentially used for older or sicker patients or for smaller low-grade tumors. Um, and also there appears to be higher local recurrence rates versus surgery, but really not significant increases in cancer-specific survival. And then also to summarize some of the active surveillance studies for small renal masses, uh, a lot of these studies don't have biopsy-proven renal cell carcinoma, and so this may skew some of the outcomes because it, they may be um, um, contaminated with benign renal masses. A lot of times these studies have older and sicker patients, um, which is why they're on active surveillance, so it's hard to see RCC progression because a lot of times these patients are dying from other causes. And there aren't a lot of studies with long-term follow-up. Uh, however, they are starting to come out um, more now, especially with the DISARM registry um, being a little bit older. In general, though, an initial period of active surveillance for small renal mass tends to be safe in the appropriately selected patient. So in a perfect world, we would perform a clinical trial to figure out the best treatment for small renal cell carcinomas. The endpoint should be survival, either cancer-specific or overall survival, and randomization is important because there's so many other competing causes of death in the patients who are older than 65 years old. So the problem is, is if you look at how to design these trials, so let's say we have 1,000 patients treated with surgery, and then we randomize 1,000 patients to be treated with another whatever, active surveillance or treated with surgery versus ablation. If you follow these patients for 10 years, 
in the patients who get surgery, you would expect the cancer specific mortality to be only about 50 patients. And then if you look at another treatment and you want it, let's say to be 20% more effective, you would expect that the RCC mortality would only be 40 patients in this cohort. So you randomize 2000 patients and you have very small numbers to compare. So that's why these studies really have been difficult to perform. This is a study that attempted it. They actually included T1 and T2 masses. They had 45 centers over 14 years and they only enrolled 541 patients and they were comparing um, radical versus partial nephrectomy for small renal masses. And essentially the trial had to be closed for futility. So these are difficult trials to perform, not impossible, but you have to understand the challenges with trying to perform a randomized trial in this setting. So, you know, what's the best treatment for small renal masses? Well, for cancer specific outcomes, it seems that surgery for younger patients and larger tumors is appropriate. And then ablation should be performed uh, at experienced centers because that can really impact the cancer outcomes and rates of local recurrence. In terms of renal function, obviously partial nephrectomy and ablation are similar and better than radical nephrectomy, which is why we've moved primarily to nephron sparing surgery for these patients. And then in terms of procedural morbidity, ablation tends to be favored, which is why we prefer it in older and sicker uh, patients. And then in terms of does the patient need treatment? Well, that gets back to everything we've talked about so far, and you have to consider patient and tumor um, risk factors. So surveillance for low risk uh, tends to be preferred. And that's all I have. Great, well, thank you so much, Dan, for that presentation. Um, looking at the participant list, uh, we've got a full audience here. Um, people at UW, we've got a lot of alums on the list and uh, friends of the department across the, the region. Uh, so happy to entertain some uh, some questions or questions in the chat room as well. And I think I saw a hand go up on the video, Dr. Nakata. Yeah, Dr. Shapiro, thank you for pinch hitting. Excellent, excellent uh, lecture. So I think the logical question, you know, and we'll go off the slides for a moment. You know, where do you think uh, renal cell carcinoma, small renal mass treatment is going? I mean, I. I appreciate the detailed analysis of the available literature and the complexity of creating, you know, outcomes-based research. But what do you think we're going to be doing with these cases in 10, 5, 10 years? What are you going to be doing with these cases in 5, 10 years? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think, you know, we've seen kind of a, a dramatic change in a lot of different treatment mod modalities. So. We're seeing increases in SBRT for renal cell carcinoma, and traditionally radiation was never used for renal cell carcinoma. So I worry a little bit that that's going to be start that people are going to start using that for primary renal tumors, which I think is, um, you know, really needs to be studied carefully. Um, but I think in general. You know, a lot of centers are moving towards ablation modalities uh, for these small renal masses, but I think that's a risky endeavor. I think surgery is still important in the appropriately selected patient because we can essentially cure these patients of their disease by doing a partial nephrectomy for a small renal mass. Now, like I said, in the older patients who are more sick and comorbid, we now know that surveillance is totally appropriate. So I think in general, uh, there seems to be a trend moving towards more ablation, but I think that has to be very carefully selected because if we're ablating, you know, young patients who have a small renal mass, there is a higher risk of local recurrence and we could have surgically cured them. So I, I tend to prefer surgical intervention in patients who can undergo surgery. Um, but we do, I think what's nice about renal cell carcinoma is we are starting to have a lot more options for patients, whereas it used to be, you know, you just get either part of your kidney or your whole kidney removed. Now we have a little bit more flexibility in what we can offer the patients. There's a question in the chat from Dr. McCachron. Um, if you find a renal mass on a CT urogram, do you still need a dedicated renal mass protocol CT? Or I guess the question is, does that still get your triphasic 
information that you need on a CTU? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on what the renal mass looks like. You know, if it's a solid enhancing renal mass, I don't think you necessarily need to um, because, you know, the, the CT urogram does have multiple phases and you can determine if the uh, tumor is enhancing. Sometimes with the cystic small renal masses, an MRI can be useful uh, to determine a, a little more accurately if there's solid components in the cystic renal mass. So it kind of depends on what you see on the CT urogram, and that's kind of how I stratify it. You know, if it looks like a slam dunk solid enhancing mass, I may not get a, another imaging uh, modality, but if it's like a cystic renal mass and I need a little more information, sometimes I'll get an MRI. Looks like a, another question from uh, Dr. Lee about cost effectiveness for the different approaches of uh, managing these. And I, I see you smile because I'm sure it's a controversial topic. Yeah. Uh, surveillance yeah, surgery relation. You know, that's a totally straightforward answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think anyone really knows what's the most cost effective management. I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, if you take out someone's tumor early in life, you could potentially save from doing a, a lot of imaging studies. Obviously, you're still going to have to surveil them postoperatively, at least for some period of time. So you can get into the weeds in terms of, you know, well, if we say we're going to cut out all these CT scans, how much is that going to save? And then if we put someone on active surveillance, is that going to save from all the, the treatment associated costs? But now we're scanning them more often. So it's a really difficult question to answer, and I don't think anyone's really effectively answered it yet. And it's probably going to be very difficult to ever answer that because there's just so many factors that get into, you know, cost effectiveness. Another question, Dan, from a uh, recent graduate, Dr. Roberts. Thank you for being here. Um, he writes, maybe outside the scope of the lecture, but can you ever stop post-treatment surveillance for small renal masses, or do patients need to be followed for life? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you get a lot of different answers depending on who you talk to. If you look at the AUA, um, you know, after five years, they basically say, they, they recommend that it's kind of shared decision-making. I tend to monitor my patients a little more closely uh, just because we do see, you know, even 10 years out after uh, performing surgery, there can be recurrences either locally or distantly. So I tend to have a kind of shared decision making conversation. And I talk to the patient about the risks and benefits. You know, if someone's 86 years old and they had a partial nephrectomy 10 years old, 10 years ago, that's a different conversation than someone who has a partial nephrectomy when they're 40 and now they're 50 and you're deciding whether or not you wanna stop surveillance. So it's a difficult question to answer, but you do have to keep in mind that we do see late recurrences. It's rare, but it does happen. So you can't necessarily think, well, they're 10 years out, that's it. You're never gonna you know, get a recurrence. There's also a comment from Dr. Grimes about the, the progress for improved patient selection in the minimally invasive treatments and surveillance, uh, understanding the risk stratification and subtyping, uh, which is uh, parallel to what's being done in the, the benign side of uh, urology as well. Uh, Dr. Grimes admits that uh, we're behind the, uh, the oncology folks, but, but catching up. Well, we're gonna keep trying to outpace you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Great. For, further questions or comments for Dr. Shapiro about uh, small renal masses? Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, sorry it wasn't Dr. Abel, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. Well, many thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for everyone's attendance this morning as well. Great to see everybody. And uh, we'll finish this WebEx session and shift over to indications. See you all soon. Bye.